privilege to be able to head the SNP. In 1999, elections for the European Parliament were held across Europe. We come from the Europe of the Cold War, uh, the Berlin Wall, to a Europe with the walls brought down, uh, a Europe of open frontiers, Europe of open markets and trade. This is so important uh, to Scotland. We've come from a time when Scotland lacked any self-confidence, when the Scots didn't think they could even have a parliament, and now it's sitting just behind me. Of course, it's not yet a full parliament. It doesn't yet bring with it the full representation of the Council of Ministers and the Commission, but it's moving in that direction. We have recovered our self-confidence. We've got our voice back. Eight members were elected to represent the whole of Scotland. Two of those were SNP members Ian Hudgeton and Professor Sir Neil McCormick. It's a great feeling to be elected. It's quite a place, this, as anybody who looks around it will see. And it is a huge responsibility to represent the whole of Scotland uh, here as one of eight uh, members of this parliament for Scotland. Uh, there are two of us from the Scottish National Party. The constituency work we split on a north-south basis. I do Argyll and most of the south. Ian does everything to the north. And that makes it quite possible to keep reasonably in touch. Of course, connecting and linking up with people on the ground with problems about Europe is very difficult. But uh, we all, in our different ways, uh, do our level best to, to make a really effective connection. It's very important to me to be able to relate uh, what I do uh, in Brussels committees uh, to real life. And uh, here in uh, urban uh, communities such as this, uh, I'm sure it's very difficult for people to think of anything that Europe has done for them. I don't think it does anything for Scotland. I wouldn't bother voting. Everything's getting out of hand now since we joined the European. You shouldn't be in it. Should not be in it. I went to the war against the Germans, and now the Germans are trying to tell me what to do. We have a problem about public perception of this parliament. The problem is actually among those who don't know what it does. Three out of four, at least three out of four, of the real people who are actually in touch with me trying to get problems of theirs solved through this parliament go away as satisfied customers. This place does things well. Above all, it's important to waste no opportunity of letting people know what's going on and what the parliament can do and why it matters to real people uh, facing real issues back home. For both Neil and Ian, it's vital that Scotland benefits as fully as possible from her membership of the European Union. There are many areas where European funding has already made a difference in Scottish life, but there are others where MEPs still have to fight for their constituents. Democracy and uh, government, whether it's at local, uh, national or European level, is supposed to be about people, uh, about real life. Uh, so it's very important to me to be able to uh, talk to real people uh, in, in their uh, communities to hear what they think, to hear what they want uh, and to know what they aspire to uh, for improvements uh, in their lives. Uh, here we are uh, in Aberdeen. It could be any urban community in Scotland, but oil-rich Aberdeen, the oil capital of Europe, is where we are. Uh, and here we have uh, typical uh, urban decay, uh, deprivation, uh, social exclusion problems, but in a community which is uh, allegedly too rich uh, to receive European structural funding. Uh, so there is a challenge here to relate European governance or indeed domestic govern governance uh, to real people in real communities. It can sometimes be necessary also for MEPs to ensure that Scotland, her people and her industries don't suffer unfairly from European laws or directives. All will be well by June because the information we are receiving from the commercial parties involved is that they cannot last until June. Uh, we've uh, problems all over Europe, including in Scotland, about water quality. Uh, you know, the state of some of our estuaries is a disgrace. The Firth of Forth is filthy in places. The, the, the beaches down the Firth of Clyde should be cleaned up. There are problems about water quality. And the only way to deal with that is on a Europe-wide basis setting uh, methods for ensuring good water standards and rules which are shared all over the place. But in some areas, for example in the Scotch whisky, the malt whisky producing areas, it would be possible for this to have damaging side effects. It would be possible to prevent people 
using spring water from springs that have been in use for 150 years, or to charge them for taking water out of springs that they've owned for 150 years. Directly behind me is the Grampian Mountains, and the, and the water source for Fetter Cairn Distillery is coming from three springs from the mountains. So we are bringing it from the bowels of the earth, bringing it into the distillery and using it as process water for mashing and for reducing the spirit and strength. The directive at the moment to us is very vague. We've been using this water from these Grampian Mountains since 1824 without this levy going on to it. And I would hopefully in the future we carry on doing that and keep the industry buoyant the way it should be. It's vital that we don't get laws that have these pointless side effects. Uh, the parliamentarians here work on that. But it's also important to interact with bodies back home, the Environmental Protection Agency in Scotland. Uh, they have to implement the laws in a sensible and sensitive way and not uh, in a way that drives vital Scottish industries out of business on the excuse of European law. It's often just an excuse. Scotland's fishermen uh, over many years have been uh, battling hard uh, against uh, too restrictive regulations, regulations which are required uh, to some extent to, in order to uh, conserve stocks uh, for the future. And it's in everyone's interest to have sensible stock conservation measures uh, so that we can um, support uh, a fishing industry uh, into the future. Uh, but some uh, of Scotland's fishermen are in fact going out of business, uh, volunteering uh, to scrap their boats uh, under decommissioning schemes uh, and uh, desperately, desperately trying to uh, battle their way through the uh, fog uh, of regulation that uh, sometimes comes from Brussels but sometimes gets elaborated on uh, by UK and Scottish uh, government ministers. I'm a fisherman. I'm actually skipper of one of the Peterhead fishing boats. There's not such a thing as Scottish fishing water. All our waters round about Scotland are controlled by the EU. So all the rules are made in Brussels and in Strasbourg. So our local MSP has to go over and represent us, tell the Parliament the problems we are and fight our case for us. It's imperative that the promotion of sustainable fisheries and the needs of fisheries dependent communities are kept to the fore. The fishing industry in, in Scotland, my, my side of the the fishing industry. I, I fish for whitefish. Haddock, cod, whiting, place is really fighting for survival just now. I mean, we have so much rules and regulations that we are really finding it hard to survive. I would like to see the Parliament and the Commission listening to the Scottish fishermen. I know we have problems in the fish stocks, but if they listen to the fishermen, and the, and the scientists together, they can come away with legislation that we can maybe survive and our, our business can become viable again. Well, my committee role uh, in the European Parliament and my constituency responsibility here in Scotland give me uh, responsibility for uh, most of Scotland's fishing industry, which means most of Britain's fishing industry. I think it's time that we had um, politicians uh, helping uh, Scotland's fishing industry, not hampering them. Scotland is a tremendously wealthy nation. We are absolutely surrounded by natural resources. There's a whole host uh, of areas where uh, Scotland is rich, uh, but where we need to uh, harness uh, that richness and develop it for a sustainable future. Scotland is uh, among the top 10 uh, wealthiest nations in the world, uh, if judged independently. Uh, and uh, what we lack, though, uh, is the political uh, control uh, which uh, normal nations have uh, in order to represent uh, our uh, industries like farming, like fishing, uh, and all uh, other aspects of our life uh, in Brussels, uh, in the European Union. Uh, most of Scottish life is influenced substantially by European regulation, but we are not represented as of right uh, at the Council of Ministers where it really matters. Uh, fisheries policy and uh, agriculture policy too 
uh, at European level uh, are decided upon uh, solely by the Council of Ministers. It's the final decisions are made by the heads uh, of ministries of uh, member governments. Uh, and that means that uh, in Scotland's case, uh, Scottish ministers do not have a right to be there, do not have a vote in the Council of Ministers. So we have the ludicrous situation uh, that, uh, in effect, Austria, with no coast and no fish, uh, has votes in the Fisheries Council, but Scotland doesn't. Within the Parliament, Neil and Ian use the power of their committees and the group to which they belong, the Greens' European Free Alliance, to further not only Scotland's interests and those of her people, but the common good of all Europeans in this union. Right, so the future of Europe. Mm -hmm. the road show idea. Yeah, so as we, we've got the two Scottish members on the convention, and we're going to have to do as much consulting as we can. I work on the, the Legal Affairs Committee and on the Constitutional Affairs Committee. The Parliament has taken part in two enormously important things just in the last two years. We adopted a Charter of Rights for the European Union. We've done some very important pieces of environmental legislation. This, I think, captures an aspect of the mood of the present time, particularly of younger voters, I think, uh, a concern with justice and human rights and a concern uh, with environmental values in the widest sense. There's no point in focusing just on the market as an economic benefit if you pollute and ruin the countryside and ruin everything. We've got to make sure that these things are done sensitively and sustainably. I'm very pleased that the group that the SNP belongs to here, the Greens and European Free Alliance, has been very much in the forefront of these movements on, on, on human rights and on environmental issues. Uh, and I think that we do stand for uh, values that increasingly are recognised as being of deep importance uh, and demand action on a Europe-wide scale. We're in the process of having a convention on the future of Europe. It will decide the future structure of the European Union. What will be the place of countries like Scotland? What will our role be in the future of this Union? If we don't have a voice, the answer, I think, will be not much of a role at all. We do have a voice. I'll be there. Other colleagues will be there. We're going to make a difference. Uh, and it's, of course, we can only make a difference if people tell us what they want. Individuals and groups have a number of ways of finding out what's happening in the European Parliament or of contacting their representatives or particular committees with concerns, problems or issues. For those with internet access, information about committees, representatives and contact details can all be obtained from the website of the European Parliament. The Greens EFA group has its own website, which also provides members' contact details. I think that people in Scotland want to uh, join in and contribute to Europe and, and our contribution will be by the people with the resources uh, and uh, that I think means uh, better and stronger ways of connecting into the European Union than we have at the moment, Don't you, wouldn't you say that Ian? Yes, I think the connect word is an important word. Uh, we talk, the European Union talks about connecting or reconnecting with citizens and it's true that unless we um, get our act together and make decisions in a way that people in the communities, the towns and villages and cities of Scotland can relate to, uh, then I think we have a problem. So it certainly made a huge difference getting a parliament of our own. It, that, that made Scotland so much more visible over here, a sense of Scotland as a, a real place with real decision making going on in it and with a real government, but still not enough. A Westminster bypass is what we need. We need to be independent. We need to be making our own decisions at home in Scotland but with the absolute right to represent uh, Scotland's point of view uh, in the Council of Ministers, crucially uh, where we don't have votes at the moment. We in Europe can become a, a focus of, of, of peace and even not to be too pompous about it, of enlightenment, of a new way of doing, and a way based in human rights and justice and a, con a constitutional way of doing. And that, I think, can give a lead to other parts. My plea is make it understandable to real people uh, that is, the, I think, the biggest yeah. single thing that we have to do. We have to make it understandable to make uh, people in Scotland, as well as every other country in Europe, uh, feel that what we are doing as uh, European partners is worthwhile, and it is for them, as well as for the wider uh, good. Yes, yes, that's just exactly the thing. That's just the thing.